Hello and welcome to the boat shed. My name is John and this boat behind me is Antidote. I'm an engineer and a sailor with a dream of fixing up this old boat to go sailing around the world. And I've got a lot of work to do first. Today we are taking a look at the head sail furlers on this boat. Now this whole channel is about restoration. We're trying to fix things. We're not just replacing parts wherever we can, but we want to try and breathe some new life into these old units. They're original to the boat. Stick around as we try to get some more useful years out of these parts. For Antidote, we have two head sail furlers. We have what I believe to be an N42 for the stay sail, and then a Pro Furl LC42 on the head sail. Now these have technically been discontinued for 10 years, maybe even a little longer. But here's the thing, they're built with parts that are readily available still. Internal bearings, seals, and snap rings are all off the shelf parts. You can order them at any bearing shop or Amazon, eBay, wherever you feel comfortable buying parts, you can probably find them there. So there's no reason that we can't rebuild the rotating parts for these two furlers. Now I will say that any of the aluminum extrusions for these, or the castings, any special parts for these profiles are gonna be very difficult to find. So if those are damaged on your boat, you might be looking to replace. But I think that we can take a pretty good shot at restoring all the rotating components on these. Every furler is gonna have two main rotating parts, this lower drum unit and then an upper swivel. So here you can see a cutaway of how the upper swivel is put together. So there's just a single bearing in most of these parts, including the lower drums. Everything is held together with spring steel snap rings, and the plan here is gonna to be to extract the accessible oil seal, and then remove the snap rings using the proper tools, and then press out or perhaps drive out the aluminum spindle, which will simultaneously push out the final oil seal. Now we can either press or tap out the final bearing, and at this point we have everything down to parts and we can assess the condition. Let's take a second to talk about the tools that you'll want to perform this work. So first, you'll want a little pick, some sort of very small tool to get in and underneath that cover on the upper swivel, and then that will expose the seal that you're gonna pull out. The best way to pull out these seals is gonna to be to drill two holes in the steel cover that goes over the lip seal. You will wanna get a long drill bit. That's gonna be helpful when you're working on the lower drum unit because it's such a deep recess. Then I've got two just generic screws here. These are gonna go in to the oil seal, and we're gonna pull them out. The best way to do that is to use a little slide hammer. So this has an end on it with a little fork so that you can get your screw in there and then pull out using that impulse of the hammer. And that's really gonna help to extract those oil seals. I've seen a lot of these get damaged by people trying to drive in screwdrivers and pry the seals out. And yes, you'll get that seal out and yes, you'll have a bunch of damage to your part. After you get the oil seal exposed, you're gonna be looking at some snap rings and so you're gonna want a pair of internal and external snap rings. Now, I highly recommend that you get a dedicated pair. These ones have jaws that do not warp. If you try to get away with the little combo set, this is great on small parts. The snap rings that are in these are 50 millimeters and 80 millimeters, and they're under a ton of tension. You will not be able to reach a lot of them, and if you can, the part is going to spring out of those, and it's gonna flick around, and leave a bunch of scratches on the inside and damage all of your surfaces. So these are nine inches and they're the minimum size that you'll want to do this job. I would probably be happy with a set of 12 inch dedicated snap ring pliers. Once you've got all that done, you're gonna be looking at pressing out the spindle and or bearings. Now you can use a seal bearing driver like this. This is a 76 millimeter. This is just about the perfect size. And then I have my dead blow mallet so this I can drive out the bearing or drive out the spindle. If you have a press, that's even better. If you don't have a press, you can get away with doing it with these two tools. Uh, applying some heat, like putting in your part in the oven for a few minutes is going to help even more. Okay, John, one second. Sort of interrupt myself, but I have an oven here in the workshop for jobs just like this, so I won't be responsible for any marital problems that might arise as a result of you putting greasy old boat parts in your oven. Now, while I have you here, you're gonna also wanna have some different tubes of different sizes for pressing in and out these odd bearings. Now, it's not as critical when you're taking things apart, but when you're putting things together, you wanna always support the parts properly so that you don't put side loads into those bearings. So I found that I needed a variety of two inch PVC pipe. I have some three inch and a three inch outer diameter aluminum pipe. And with all of this together, I was able to press it all in. You may also want to add a really nice finely tapered rounded end feeler gauge like this one to your toolkit. 
for this job. Um, stick around to the end of the video to find out why. We'll put links down in the description for all of these parts and odds and ends and anything I can think of that's useful, we'll keep adding to that. Okay, now back to it. So these are the tools that I'm looking at using. Let's get started on the process. This is the stay sail further. These two parts here go together to make that system and this has an audible sound to it. And it feels a little gritty when I'm turning it. And I can even see this one oil seal is pressed in all cattywampus. It's on a visible angle. So let's see if we can get these swivels working as good as new. This one actually turns quite nicely, but I can see that the seals are kind of cracked and just drying out. So we'll replace all this too. So we're gonna to try to pull this little seal out here. You can see a screwdriver mark here where someone was in before me. Pretty tight fit. Here we go, so just this little plastic sort of ring. And that now exposes the lower bearing. No really easy way to get that out. What I like to do sometimes, these have a little metal sort of cage in them. And I'll, I'll sometimes drill a small hole in them and actually put a screw or something in there and try and yank them out. So that's what we'll do. But I don't think there's any other way to get that out. Just drive a couple of screws in here. Okay, so now we've got two screws in there. And so we're gonna try and pull this out now. So we'll try the vice grips here, see if we can get these screws to pull out. Well, rather, if we can get the seal to move. I th didn't think so. Now I might be able to actually push the seal out by driving the screws in further. I'm just not sure what it would be pushing against. And I don't wanna damage anything inside. We'll try to pull it out and if that fails, maybe we'll resort to that. All right, we are going to try, operative word here, to hold that screw by using this blind bearing puller and this hose clamp. Now this is one of those stainless non-ribbed hose clamps. These are really all I like to see on anything because those other ones with the perforations, they're, they're just liable to break all the time. And I'll show you something crazy related to those and our boat here soon. Now that's got it tight and it's kind of putting some weird load on the screw because it's not, See so if we can get it to move at all. There you go. What I'm looking at now is a bunch of big circlips. So there you go, there's one way to get a rubber bearing seal out. All right, so for the snap rings, we're gonna use dedicated snap ring pliers. And these will do a great job of holding the snap rings properly and letting them come out. So this is what we're gonna use. First thing I wanna do is just kinda of get the whole thing loosened up. See, it's kinda of stuck. That's the biggest snap ring I think I've ever messed with in my life. So now, this inner piece should press out. We're first gonna try to tap it out using a hammer here. See if we can get it to move. So there's a, another circlip in there that has pushed out this seal. Interesting. Okay, so we'll take this circlip off now. And then this last seal should just pull right off. We'll get all these parts cleaned up and then we're gonna stick this last part in the oven at 250F for 10 to 20 minutes. I'm hoping that the aluminum will expand more than the steel and this bearing should pop out pretty easily. Okay. Right, we'll see if we can just knock it out here. We go. All right, next we want to take a look at this lower drum unit for the stay sail. This has a heavily recessed oil seal to bring out first, so this is going to be a little bit more of a challenge. We're going to have to use a little longer drill bit than as usual. So 
now we're gonna try to yank this out with the slide hammer. There it goes. <laughs> okay, so it looks like the same thing. We got an inner and an outer circlip in there. The tricky thing will be getting all the way in there. <laughs> nice. Okay, that's surprising. I'm glad we were able to get that out. So now, we can try and tap this through. Well, let's see if we can get anything to go here. And now there's one more circlip on here to take off and then the seal will come out. Definitely some rust from the old bearing. And you can really see on this one how the, the lip seals wore out the anodization. Just something I'd kind of read about, but one interesting thing about this was that this one, when I was spinning it, it seemed like it was running really smooth. That was probably all just in the grease because now when I spin it, now that it's all cleaned out, it's just a big, messy, loose bearing, just like the other one. All right, this is all pulled apart and we are ready to get this bearing out. So let's pop it in the oven like the other one and see if we can get that last bearing to come free. Can you stand by the block? and explain to me what this is. That is our kitchen scale. Why is it in the garage? <laughs> um, I was weighing fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Clean, dry fiberglass. On our kitchen scale? <laughs> I'm sorry, I bought my own for the shop, don't worry. It's clean. Shaking my head at you. <laughs> 42 here. They're more or less the same and all of these units have generally the same components. There's a couple of extra bearings here and there and a larger circlip, but I think if you have a 31 millimeter, a 42 or a 52 millimeter peripheral unit from this same era, then these directions will more or less apply to you as well. Now I started using the drill press during this last piece to start taking the bearings out and it actually worked really well. Now someone's going to be watching and saying, screaming at the computer, you can't use the drill press for that, and I sort of agree with you, but it is a press, and although it's not as good as a shop press, it's what I have, and it actually worked really well. It offers some advanced leverage, and if you don't put too heavy of a load on it, everything should be fine. Anyway, let's take a look at the upper swivel now that we've got it all down to pieces. This is the full parts breakdown on the upper swivel for our N42 late 80s Pro Furl furling unit, and these run on a single 80 by 50 by 10 carbon steel bearing, just a regular off the shelf bearing there. All of these parts from here to here, you can buy at pretty much any bearing supplier. The, the main thing is you gotta keep this bearing protected. They say lifetime, or no, well they say maintenance free bearing. And what that means is as long as there's grease on this bearing and it's protected from water by these two oil seals, your further is gonna work just fine. The problem is that it relies on this anodized aluminum sleeve, this inner swivel, and this surface here and here have to be in great shape for these oil seals to maintain a good seal and keep the water out of this bearing. So you can see this one's been damaged from a previous operation. Somebody took it apart at one point and probably used the wrong tools, and that's what's left some really big scars here. In my opinion, with the right tools, these can be taken apart fairly easily and without any damage to the unit, so they can be rebuilt and almost as good as new. You might notice the anodization wearing off just so slightly on the swivel where the boil seals contact, but you can also work around that. Probably the biggest reason that these get damaged after taking out that one oil seal is getting these circlips off. So definitely want to have the right tools for the job. I'm going to get started now on cleaning this up for some, we're just gonna use JB Weld to fill in some of the low spots where the scratches are, smooth them down with a nice smooth file and we should be good to go. To do that, we're gonna start by wiping this down with a good solvent, something like acetone would be good, just to get any kind of oil and grease anything off this part. Then what we wanna do is 
just as easy as we can file or sand these little scratches and abrasions just to give them a really nice clean aluminum finish. You don't want the old aluminum oxide on there. So we're gonna try and clean those up without making them much bigger or deeper, maybe just a very mild file. That's the tricky part. After that, we'll mix up some good old JB Weld. We'll apply this nice and thin in here. We'll probably use an X-Acto knife blade to sort of just lay them in and keep them as flat as we possibly can. And then the trick will be, if you don't have access to like a lathe to turn this right back exactly around, you're gonna wanna catch it at that stage where it's just sort of gone plastic, probably with your regular JB Weld, four to six hours. And then you can shave it off with a knife, just very carefully turn it and just shave off the little bits as you go. Uh, there might be other ways to do it, but you generally just wanna get the surface as smooth as possible. You know, if you can hit it with your fingernail, then the oil seal's gonna have a problem with it. So when we're done, we should be able to not even distinguish where these scratches were. And I would recommend using the Marine version or the regular stuff. There could be other products out there too, but the longer open time, the better generally. The quick stuff isn't probably as good because it's not as strong. So to give yourself the best chance of a long lasting repair, we're gonna try it with the regular brand, original JB Weld. These parts are all cleaned up and ready to go back together. But before we get to that, I wanted to show you this prototype that I put together. So this is an upper swivel that I found lying in the bilge of the boat. Now it's been taken apart before and it looks like all they had available was a hammer and maybe a rock. So this thing is in rough shape. Now it was completely seized. We've got it all put back together with brand new parts. So this would be a nice spare. After getting this all cleaned up, I drilled two holes, one on either side of the bearing above and below where the bearing will be. My thought here was that I could install a grease fitting and then I could pump in fresh grease periodically to keep the part maintained. This is certainly one way to address the problem. It does give you the benefit of allowing new grease to enter. It does also introduce two leak points into the system. I've decided to go a different direction and here's why. I have traditional grease in here right now. This is the Lucas Marine Grease. It's a highly rated grease for this application. I think it will work very well, but greases do wash out. And as I was searching for the grease I wanted to use for this project, I came across some articles talking about using Tef gel as a grease for bearings. And I thought that was an interesting concept. I managed to get through to the inventor of this product. His name is Bob and he spoke to me on the phone. We talked about Tef gel and the interesting thing about Tef gel is that it does not wash out. You can't touch it with water. The only thing that gets rid of it is mineral spirits. And he assures me that this will stay in the further bearings for a very, very long time and protect them because it's also really good at isolating metals and protecting them from water. So they make a version of Tef gel called Thin. So my current plan for the LC42 rebuild is to use the Tef gel Thin for the bearing grease in that unit. Let's rebuild it without drilling the holes. We'll see how it works. And if we need to, in the future, come back and wash all this out and put traditional grease in with the grease nipples, we can do that. But I think let's try to avoid drilling those extra holes and let's give this a shot and see how it works. It's supposed to work amazingly well under extreme pressure, which is something that's important to me for the grease that I select. And with the properties of it not washing out, I think it's worth a try. Let's give it a shot. We'll be replacing all the internal parts on these furlers. Now I won't get into all the details here, but I will put them in the description below so you can reference that. I will say though that you're gonna wanna use carbon steel bearings, even though that seems totally counterintuitive. Proferl has documented that stainless bearings deform under the loads needed and they just don't work properly. So a carbon steel bearing still works well. Now apparently the original oil seals had stainless steel springs. And to me, I don't really understand why a stainless steel spring is necessary when you have a plain carbon steel bearing inside. When water gets in, it's all gonna rust. But maybe I'm missing something there. Anyway, if you've got stainless springs in your oil seals, that's great. Smoke them if you got them. We're all ready to go here. So these are the used parts. So now the first step is gonna be to press the bearing into this. So for that, we're gonna get this piece warmed up a little bit, let it expand just ever so slightly. I'm gonna put this in the oven at 275. When we get to around 250 Fahrenheit on the part, we're gonna pull it out, press the bearing in. All right, while we're waiting for that part to heat up, let's just put a tiny amount of this Tef gel on the outer race of the bearing just to help with the dissimilar metals between the aluminum. And this might also just help lubricate the bearing as it slides in. It is a interference fit. And now we'll go check on the temperature of the part, maybe put a little bit on the inner race of that and then press this bearing in.
Okay, great. So somewhere between the added heat and the tough gel, that bearing just dropped right into place. There was almost no pressure on that. And I really do recommend heating these if you can. You can press them in so much easier than if you're trying to hammer them, you're gonna get them probably skewed. So if you have the tools, might as well use them. So we're probably gonna need to let that cool down a little bit, but we can put in the main circlip. I'm just gonna put in a little bit of this Tef Gel in the groove the circlip rides in. I just feel like any opportunity to add this stuff, which has a great reputation for preventing dissimilar metals from misbehaving. So I'm gonna put a bit of the Tef Gel now into the bearing before I put the circlip in, just so that I have lots of room to work in here. Okay, I think we could put the circlip in now. So we'll get a little bit of Tef Gel on our circlip. These things are under a lot of pressure. I think I'm gonna put some safety glasses on for this part. Because this pin is on the upper bearing race, it actually comes in through that little gap. So the opening of the circlip needs to be right here. Otherwise it won't seat fully. So let's try and get that going. Okay, that feels like it went in really nicely. Okay, so the next step, the spindle will go through the other side with a seal on it and the circlip already installed and then that. So it starts pretty nicely. We might not need to heat this up. Let's try and see if we can just press that in. So first thing here, we'll grease up our seal, putting it in between the two lips, trying to get that really full. So now we are going to put a little bit on the part and now we'll drop the seal all the way on. Okay. We'll put on the standard size clip and then press this piece in. And you wanna make sure that you've got this thing spread out nice and evenly and then lower it down because you really want to avoid losing it halfway and having it drop on and put a big nick into the metal. So for pressing in this piece, these pieces together, because you always wanna be pressing on the race that is receiving the load, if that makes sense. So when we're pressing in this spindle, I wanna be supporting the inner race of the bearing. So I don't wanna just put this down and press the piece in. I wanna support that inner race. So this piece of two inch PVC pipe, Schedule 40 pipe, this is commonly available here in North America and Canada, not sure about the rest of the world, but this conveniently matches the inner race diameter almost perfectly. So we'll put that down, put our piece on top, and then we can press the spindle in. And we'll, for that, we'll use the, the bearing driver, 76 millimeter on top, push that in. And then once the seal gets in the way, we will take out this, this is oversized because this is, I've made this to fit the lower units as well, but this will go around the unit and then press in the seal edges and get that on. So that's the plan. Here we go. Almost forgot, before I put the seal in, I do want to add this little three millimeter spacer. I've been cutting these out of a, a piece of aluminum pipe and just opening them up slightly so that they fit around. That'll just help lift the seal up and keep it flush on what will eventually end up being the bottom. Let's press this together. There it goes. That's got it pushed in, and I've got access now to both the circlips. Excellent. So now we should be able to drop in the larger of the two circlips. Oh yeah, that's in there, good. Okay, great. So for the LC42 here, for a little extra holding power up top, there is another spacer, and then another circlip that goes in. I'll do them 180 apart. Let's do that. For the LC, it's gonna be very important that I use the three millimeter spacer to raise the bearing because otherwise I'm gonna not be able to clear that internal circlip and the, the extra spacer. So let's get this installed, get the bearing or the seal rather all greased up. Great, all that's left to do now is to press that seal in the rest of the way. So we'll head over to the drill press for that. And this is just a three inch ABS pipe. Again, common here, not sure about the rest of the world. And this is my 81 millimeter. And it just so happens that that holds that just about perfectly. So 
that's got the swivel for the Genoa looking great. All put back together, that seal pressed in really nice and flat. It looks really good. I think it's gonna break in really well. All right, carrying on with the LC42, we are moving on to the lower drum unit. So that is gonna be more or less the same as the previous unit. It's just a lot taller and it's sort of upside down. But the LC42, if you're using an N42 or something else, you might just have a single bearing. The LC42 has a thicker location for two bearings. So we're gonna double stack that one. So when you go to press those into here, it's gonna be a little bit more involved to push two bearings all the way down. We'll probably do them one at a time. We'll just have to see how that goes. But that's what we're doing next. This thing's in actually really good shape. So we're excited to put it back together. So we're ready to get started. First thing up is to put this in the oven, heat it up so that we can press the bearings in. While we're waiting for that to heat up, let's go ahead and get the seal on here and the first circlip, making sure it's seated all the way around. This is ready to go. So I think our part's probably hot. Let's press those bearings in. So it might be easier to do these one at a time. All right, that's looking great. The bearing is pressed in all the way right to the stops. All right, let's put that circlip snap ring way down in there and we'll be ready to insert the spindle. That's the pin, the blanked off pin, and that's exactly where we have the gap for the snap ring. That was very intentional because there's a little bump there, so that keeps everything in all the way nice and tight. This piece is ready to press in. All right, that's a good start. Try and push the bearing on. I mean the seal, I keep saying that. That worked out really well. Last circlip, one more seal and then we're home free here. So we're having a little bit of a problem with these oil seals pushing out. As I'm forcing them together, all that air and grease, the pressure is going up. And so the seals, once I remove my tools, the seals just kind of slowly push back out. Now that's not gonna work. I've heated up my oven to 210 degrees. The reason I picked that temperature is the oil seals are rated to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, so they should be fine up to that temperature. My hope is that by forcing them back together at that temperature and letting them cool, they'll naturally stay together. Now, one other thing I did just to help me with that is I lubricated this really nicely tapered feeler gauge. This is a 14 thousandths or 0.35 millimeter feeler gauge, and it has a really nice rounded edge. So I was able to just sneak it past the oil seal next to the spindle very carefully. And of course, I, like I said, I got the Teff gel on it. And my hope was that I could push the lips of the seal back just enough to then when I forced it back through to let a bit of air out. And I did hear a little bit of a gasp. This LC42 is ready to go back on the boat. It feels amazing, super smooth. The seals are sitting in the right place. So all those little tips and tricks worked out in the end. And so this thing's gonna get a whole new life. We're gonna give it another spin and we're gonna try the Teff gel grease and see how well that holds up. So I will let you know, it might be a little while, but we will get back to you on that. And if you give it a try, I'd love you to let us know in the comments how it works for you. If this video has been helpful to you and I hope that it has, this is a great time to hit that like button for me. I appreciate that very much. So maybe you're considering a rebuild of one of these types of units. There's lots of different sizes and models. They're all gonna be pretty much the same. So if you follow these general guides, I think you'll be fine. I can't stress strongly enough how important it is to get the right tools for the job though. So make sure you pick all those up and add that to the budget. So what's this gonna cost you? Well, altogether I spent 150 US dollars on parts to rebuild the LC42, a little less on the N42. Now, depending on where you get your parts from, your mileage may vary, but to me that is money well spent. I'd like to give a big thanks to the folks on Patreon and an extra special big thanks to the folks whose names are appearing on this screen. You all make it possible for me to continue making these productions and I thank you very much. We put out a new video about this project every two weeks. Now, if you're new and you'd like to get caught up from the very beginning, then the playlist is right here. I recommend you check that out. And if you'd like to subscribe for more of our content, then this button's for you. See you next time. So now we're just waiting for a minute. <laughs> oh, it's ready. <laughs> Good to remember which way it goes back in. <laughs> Good thing I have a video record, right?